Imagine three days when the sky and the ground seem to move together. In just 72 hours, two distant stars blew up into view, two strong earthquakes struck the same part of Venezuela, and a blast from the sun ploughed into a rare interstellar visitor called 3I ATLS. Astronomers now call that stretch the 72-hour stack. It felt like the universe pressed fast forward and hit everything at once. Was it a freak run of luck or a pattern we do not yet understand? Let us start with what actually happened. First, a nova appeared. A nova is a sudden flare from a dead star called a white dwarf. It brightens fast when fresh hydrogen falls onto it and ignites. On September 23, just after 02 UTC, a star named V1935 Centauri jumped to magnitude 5.8. That is just bright enough to see with the naked eye from a dark place. Survey telescopes in Chile and South Africa caught it within minutes. Alerts went out before Europe had breakfast. The next night, the ground shook. At 2221 UTC on September 24, a magnitude 6.2 earthquake hit near Mani Grande in Venezuela. The source was shallow, only about 8 kilometers deep, so the shaking reached homes and streets quickly. Less than six hours later, at 0351 UTC on September 25, a second shock struck the same region. A magnitude 6.3, a little deeper, but still strong. An aftershock near magnitude 5.8 rolled through within an hour. Then the sky flashed again. At 0405 UTC on September 25, another nova erupted, V7994 Sagittaria. Its peak brightness reached about magnitude 6.2, also at the edge of naked eye visibility. In the same window, a coronal mass ejection, a CME from the Sun swept across the inner solar system and crossed the projected path of 3I80 LS, the only confirmed interstellar object in our skies at that moment. All of that happened between September 23 and September 25. How unlikely is that run of events? There are two ways to answer. The first is raw numbers. A naked eye nova is rare. Some years we do not get any. Two in less than two days is unusual by itself. Strong Venezuelan quakes in the same zone happen maybe every few years. Having two big ones within hours is another long shot. A CME is common during solar maximum, but a direct overlap with a rare interstellar visitor adds more weight. Stack these odds and the total drops below one in a thousand by many back-of-the-envelope estimates. The second answer is about how randomness behaves. Statisticians have a term for clusters of rare things that land together by chance, quasi-clustering. Random processes do not spread events evenly. Sometimes they bunch up and make up pattern-loving brains think something deeper is going on. So, which is it? A free cluster or a hidden link? To find out, it helps to zoom in on each piece and explain it in plain language. Start with the nova. A nova is not a star exploding to death. It is a star flaring to life again for a short time. Picture a white dwarf, a burnt-out core about the size of Earth and as dense as a city made of lead. It sits next to a normal star and steals thin streams of hydrogen from it. That gas piles up on the white dwarf's surface. Pressure and heat rise until the layer lights like a match. Fusion runs away and the star brightens by tens of thousands or even hundred thousand times in hours to days. Then it fades over weeks. That is what V1935 Centauri did on September 23. A major astronomer, Gabriela Moya in Valparaiso, Chile, spent the night controlling a remote telescope despite clouds and power glitches. When the flare was confirmed, she sent a notice to the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams at 0212 UTC. Orbiting instruments later reported a bump in gamma rays and hard X-rays too. That is the fingerprint of shocks when fast material from the flare slams into slower gas and heats it up. Less than two days later, V7994 Sagittarii did the same in another part of the sky. Survey teams in space telescopes like Fermi and Swift saw the high-energy flash almost at once. Detecting two naked eye novae in one three-day stretch is rare but not impossible. These are binary systems dotted through the Milky Way. Each has its own clock. Sometimes two clocks ring together. Now the earthquakes. The area around Mene Grande sits on the complex boundary between the Caribbean plate and the South American plate. That region is under constant slow strain. When a fault locks and then slips, the stress can jump to a neighbor and trigger a second rupture. The September sequence looks like that. A first quake at 6.2, then a second at 6.3, along a nearby segment, then a 5.8 aftershock. Seismologists mapped a classic stress transfer along the Oka Unconn fault zone and saw the aftershocks decay just as expected. In other words, those quakes follow known rules, even if the timing adds drama. The human side of the quakes tells a second story. 
At the local hospital, senior nurse Marisela Rivas had just ended her shift when the first shock hit. Within minutes, she and her team had triage taps down in the parking lot. They moved the most serious patients away from cracked walls and set up water and light where they could. After the second quake, they evacuated again as monitors beeped on backup power. Radio stations relayed supply lists and safe routes. The science explains why it happened. The people show how a community copes when it does. Now the sun. Solar maximum is a busy phase in an 11-year cycle. Sunspot counts are high. The solar radio flux stays elevated. The sun throws off CMEs, clouds of charged gas and magnetic field lines that race outward at hundreds to thousands of kilometers per second. When a CME hits a comet, it can tear and kink the tail. Sometimes it disconnects the tail entirely and the gas floats away like a flag ripped loose. What makes this CME noteworthy is the target in its path. 3i ATLS is the third confirmed interstellar object after Oumuamua in 2017 and Borisov in 2019. That means it was formed around another star and was ejected into interstellar space long ago. It's not from our Oort cloud or Kuiper belt. It's on a retrograde path, nearly skimming the solar system's plane and moving fast, roughly 60 km per second. Its route brings it within about 0.19 AU of Mars on October 3, which is close enough for orbiters like MAVEN and ExoMars TGO to try to observe its coma and tail. Because it's interstellar, the ices and dust it carries may be different. Watching a CME hit it during solar maximum is a once-in-a-generation chance to learn how alien material reacts to solar weather. Put the pieces back on a single line and the 72-hour stack looks dense because it is. Here's a simple timeline in UTC. September 23, 0 to 12, V1935 Centauri detected at naked eye brightness. September 24, 10 to 221, magnitude 6.2 quake near Mene Grande. September 25, 0351, magnitude 6.3 quake in the same region. September 25, 0405, V7994 Sagittaria erupts into visibility. During September 25, a CME launch the previous day sweeps across the inner solar system and crosses the projected path of 3i ATLS within an 8-hour window. Each event on its own would make news. All of them in three days makes a pileup. It is fair to ask the pattern question. Could a solar storm trigger quakes? Far more often than not, no. The energy scales and coupling are different. Earth's crust moves because of plate tectonics. The sun does not flip a switch and make a fault slip. Could novae and CMEs be linked? Not in any direct way. Novae happen light years away in binary systems. Each has its own clock. Sometimes two clocks ring together. What we are left with is a cluster. Rare things sometimes land together. That's not magic. It's how randomness works. Still, the 72-hour stack gives science a gift. It sets up a series of natural experiments that we can prepare for and learn from in the weeks ahead. October is full of chances to point instruments and answer hard questions. First up is C2025R2 SWAN. Around October 2021, it will pass about 0.26 AU from Earth roughly 39 million kilometers. The timing is perfect, the moon is new and the Orionids meteor shower is near its peak. That means dark skies for a faint iron tail. Best time is after midnight, well away from city lights. Bring binoculars, 7x50 or 10x50 help a lot. Give your eyes at least 30 minutes to adjust to darkness. Use a red flashlight or dim your phone screen. A star chart or a night sky app can guide you. Next is 3i Atlas, perihelion on October 29 at about 1.36 AU from the Sun. It will not be a daylight object. Experienced observers might try for views in dawn or dusk, but safety comes first. Never point optics anywhere near the Sun without certified solar filters placed over the front of the lens. Even a brief unfiltered look through binoculars can cause permanent eye damage. If there is any doubt, do not try. The third date to circle is December 19, when 3i Atlas makes its closest approach to Earth, about 1.8 AU away. That is still far, but it is the most favourable window for amateur imaging after the perihelion changes. If the comet's activity ramps up after its close pass by the Sun, the coma and tail could be easier to catch. Community science groups are already asking for help. The AAVSO International Comet Quarterly and the Comet Observation Database post calls for visual magnitude estimates, tail sketches and time-lapse photos. If you see something unusual, a sudden brightening, a new kink in the tail or a tail disconnection event, write down the exact time, your location and your equipment. 
compare with others, then submit to the official channels. That keeps the data clean and useful. So what about 3i Atlas itself? Why is this object in so many headlines? It has a long list of oddities that make it worth a close look. Early photometry shows a smooth five-fold brightening far from the sun, where water ice should still be frozen. That suggests early activation from other ices like CO or CO2 or dust physics we do not fully model yet. Spectra from the very large telescope show nickel lines while iron is missing or very suppressed, which is strange. In most comets, iron and nickel travel together because they were forged together in ancient stars. The coma and tail are obvious and yet the orbit shows almost no non-gravitational acceleration. In other words, the jets do not seem to push the nucleus off course the way they usually do. Each of these points has natural explanations to test. Early CO2 leaks can make light scatter, dust sizes and shapes can boost brightness, shells in the crust could redirect thrust, selective chemistry can sometimes favor nickel. But each test needs data. What test makes sense now? Watch the light curve with high cadence. If the brightness rises and falls on a steady schedule that does not drift much as the viewing angle changes, that is a clue. Check the chemistry. Do CN and C2, the green comet makers, appear as the sun heats the surface? Do CO2 and water lines rise and fall the way simple models predict? Measure the heat. A passive object warms with sunlight and cools without it. If the infrared curve flattens to neat plateaus, that could be internal heat control. Track the orbit in detail. Fit gravity, radiation pressure and expected jet pushes into the model. If the leftover residuals point in one steady direction, someone or something is cancelling the pushes or the shell is eating them. None of these answers require belief. They require careful measurements. Even if the 72-hour stack is just a loud coincidence, it has focused attention in a good way. It has brought professionals and amateurs into the same conversation. It has reminded us that some of the best science happens when the plan gets interrupted and we look with fresh eyes. It has also reminded us to be adults about risk. Comets near the sun are photographic, but the sun is unforgiving. Review safety before any dawn or dusk attempt. Keep all optics well away from the sun. Use only ISO 12312-2 certified filters over the front of lenses. Teach kids not to point lasers near aircraft or optics. The sky is patient. There will be other nights. You might still feel that itch that says there must be a deeper pattern. It is human to connect dots. Sometimes that skill saves our lives. Sometimes it tricks us. Two no way in one window do not talk to earthquakes. Earthquakes do not talk to the sun. A CME does not talk to distant white dwarfs, but all of them talk to us. They put us in the same posture, careful, curious and humble. They ask us to write down what we see and to let the numbers decide. In the weeks ahead, watch for a few things. Mars orbiter teams may share images or spectra if they catch 3i Atlas's coma near the October 3 flyby. Solar weather centers will post updates as new CMEs roll off the sun. Rubin LSST will begin its rhythm of deep wide surveys that turn missed chances into early alerts. Amateur networks will post side-by-side -side pictures that turn single frames into time. And journals will fill with preprints that try to fit simple and not so simple models to the same curves. If you want to be part of the story, you can. You do not need a giant telescope. You need clear skies, a safe plan, and the patience to spend a few nights chasing faint light. Write careful notes, share raw frames, ask questions, be ready to be wrong, so together we can get closer to right. At the end of that wild 72-hour sprint, we still don't know whether we saw a pattern or a pileup. We know this, the stack is real, it is documented, it is a rare outlier, one for the record books. Two Nove lit the sky, two quakes shook a nation, a solar storm crossed the path of an interstellar traveller. The odds are small. The timeline is tight. The lesson is simple. Sometimes nature's rarest moves happen out in the open. The only way to meet them is with clear eyes, steady hands and a little wonder.